the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 770 for Monday, July 15th, 2019. And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab. You know, it's the place we all get together every week so that we can answer your questions and share your tips and share your cool stuff found. We can share some cool stuff found of our own. You know the goal, though, and that is for each of us to learn at least five new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include... Cashfly at mac.cashfly.com and experian.com slash MGG. We will talk about why you want to visit both of those URLs and get something free out of it, of each of them. Yep, it's true. We'll talk about that in a moment. For now, here, well, I'm here like joining all of you at Mac Geek Cab, but while I'm doing that, I'm simultaneously here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John Braun. Ah, oh, Mr. Braun, how are we today? <sighs> it's getting hot, man. It is like red fish bone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Boy, if that's not a buried reference, I don't know what is. Um, anyway, let's uh, before we go too deep on that, because we can't. Uh, we don't know. We don't know where that came from. Uh, Domenico, save us. He has a quick tip. He says, uh, this one gets me every time when setting up a smart home device that has built in uh, Wi-Fi that lets you use it to configure it like its own Wi-Fi router uh, that you have to change your Wi-Fi signal to connect to the smart home device and then program it from there to connect to yours. Make sure that you turn off any VPN software that tries to turn itself on uh, with new Wi-Fi networks, because, of course, since that device can't connect to the Internet, the VPN can never fully activate and the smart home device will not connect with your phone because your phone's VPN profile won't let any traffic across until the VPN is active. He says uh, you won't get any informative error message about this. And if you're like me, you'll pull your hair out trying to figure out why and you're you'll curse at that horrible piece of junk you bought, when in reality, it's just your dodgy memory and your VPN acting up again. Ask me how I know this, he says. I got caught, now hopefully others won't. This is great advice. I have gotten caught on this too. So yeah, especially if you're set up, well, it doesn't matter how you're set up, but yeah, if your VPN is set up to just auto-join or auto-connect and you know block traffic until it connects, which is how many of them work and how we want them to work, You have to turn that off. Uh, Otherwise, you would run into exactly this scenario. So thanks very much, man. That's great. (laughs) Very, very good. Thoughts on that, John, before we move on to the next quick tip to start the day? Yeah, I've run into that. Yeah. um, (laughs) Yeah, for sure. No, like a lot of, uh, like, for example, if you're in a Pokemon Go and stuff like that, a lot of, uh, a lot of apps well, it gets upset because I think it thinks you're trying to <clears throat> um, change your location or spoof your location. Oh, that too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had that happen one time. I was, you know, trying to run it, and the app just failed. It Here's wouldn't run a- properly, and I'm like, "Gee, why is that?" And then I look, and I see the little VPN icon uh, up in the menu bar there, or on the top of the screen. Yeah, and I'm like, right. Ah, oh, that's why it's not running. Right. Right. A couple of years. This reminds me a couple of years ago. I don't know if it's still doable now, but my son had uh, been able to like download or configure Pokemon Go and and hack it in some way on his iPhone that he could travel to any location at any time. Uh, So like he could if he wanted to pretend he was in Paris, he could be in Paris. Uh, so I'll put a link to the thing that I think that he used. I think it was through Tutu app or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
obviously not blessed by the Pokemon Go people, of course, because mm. you know that that goes without saying, right? But yeah, I'll put a link to that in the uh, in the show notes too. But yeah, right. It, but he did note that he had to kind of be careful doing that and make sure not to um uh, not to do it too often otherwise it would uh it would cause issues so yeah oh yeah well somebody will break out the band hammer right yes right. exactly <laughs> yes it, right exactly yeah yes yes all right uh keith has another quick tip for us he says i'm a couple episodes behind so playing catch up can't remember the exact episode where you mentioned the tip of swiping the screen sideways using the line at the bottom on the iPhone 10 series phones when in an app to switch to the last uh, previously used apps instead of swiping up to get to the app switcher. He says, I have more swiping stuff for you. Does that that's like door explorer, right? Swiper more swiping, right? Uh, some people may not realize that this sideways swipe is also available on the home screen, even though there's no horizontal line at the bottom. Simply swipe along the bottom of the screen below the springboard from left to right, and you will switch to the last opened app. Another swipe tip, but this time on Apple Watch. This is something I use all the time and absolutely amazed a friend of mine when I showed it to him. If you have a workout uh, running and the workout activity screen is displayed, you can swipe from right to left to bring up now playing. This is great for getting uh, quickly back to the volume control or the navigation controls to skip forwards and backwards. A swipe from left to right takes you back to the workout activity display. This works for anything you're playing, and I use it when I'm listening to music podcasts via the Audible app or even the Mac Geek Gab app, which is being played via the Mac Geek Gab app on my iPhone. A friend always had to hit the button, find now playing, and select it before I showed him the swipe. I hope this is useful. So there you go. Thank you, Keith. That's great. That I I always forget about the swipe on the home screen. Actually, I forget about both of these. So this is the epitome of a quick tip, which is great. So and of course, don't forget about the Mac Geek Gab iOS app because it exists. It exists. It's good. I'll put it in. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes at, at, at the show notes at macgeekgab.com. Of course. Any thoughts on any of these swipes, John? Yeah, I ran across this the other day. It's, I don't know. Yeah, I think, uh, so if you, at least on my eight, if you uh, just swipe from the center down, that brings up one of the uh, auxiliary screens. I'm, trying to, I'm not even sure what it's called here. Okay. Yeah. What, Try it. Swiping, I, I don't know it, swiping it, wait, say, describe that again so for just, me? Uh, so just... Swipe from the center, uh, swipe down from the center to the bottom of the, the screen, and it brings up series suggestions and all that stuff here. Swipe down. I think down there's another way to get there. From the center of the screen on your iPhone? Yeah. Doesn't that just bring up notification center? Yeah, that, that, that's what's happening there. Oh, okay. Is that No, no, no. It's not notification center. It's another screen. I don't know. Try it sometime. I'm doing it right now. If I swipe down... If, if I swipe down from the left or the center, I get notification center and then can swipe, you know, left to right with my finger and get uh, all my widgets. And then if I swipe from the upper right corner is where I get control center. But is there something else that I'm missing? Yeah, so that brings up notification center. But if you... um no, I'm with you. So if you swipe down, like from the upper right hand corner, I get yeah, that brings up notification center. center. <clears throat> oh, you're not on an iPhone 10. We're on different yeah. iPhones. That that may that is that. I don't think that changes that though. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you swipe from the right corner down. You get no you get say, control say you center. Did. No, I get not uh, uh, in the upper right hand corner. I get notification center. Interesting. That's where I get control center. So maybe that is different on the iPhone 10. Yeah. All right. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so if you swipe just from the center, you get you get you get a third option when swiping. Is that essentially what you're saying? 
if I swipe from the center to the bottom, yep, I get Siri suggestions uh, uh-huh. and some other things here. Interesting. And yeah, how I just do did you the, get I just, control center? <clears throat> well, that I think if I swipe from the... Uh, is that swiping? Yeah, so if I swipe from the left... To, uh, no, no, if I swipe from the very bottom... Right, which I can't do because I don't have a home button. Uh, right, yeah. okay, that, I, okay, now we're... Now I fig- okay, now it makes sense. Huh, interesting. Interesting, interesting. I always forget about this because, right, because iPhone 10. Yeah. I'll have to mess with that later on the, I don't have a seven in, in front of me here, but yeah. Anyway, there we go. Uh, let's see. I want to actually, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, which is Experian Boost. Man, like I mentioned that this was free. Right. So you're going to go to Experian.com slash MGG. That's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N.com slash MGG. Because Experian is on a mission to help boost America's credit score, which will help lots of us. Right. And for the first time ever, you can do something that in real time can control your credit score, because what Experian Boost does is it works by giving you credit for all the utility and telecom bills that you're paying with your checking or savings account. Right. So water, gas, electric, cable, cell phone. You aren't getting credit for those yet if you're not using Experian Boost. So you go to Experian.com slash MGG and you can submit this stuff that way and it will show you what it's going to do to your credit score. And if it's going to raise it, you say yes, if you want. You could say no if you don't want it to raise it. But if it's going to lower it for some reason, then you could say no. And, and it's never added to your, your score, right? So this is the first time that you really get to control what's going on in an instant way. And only positive payments will be factored in, right? So you really get to take control of this. It's it's awesome. Uh, you know, I'm crazy about my credit score. I have been for a very long time. Uh, it's one of the topics that John and I talk about when we're not doing this show because we're both sort of crazy about our, our credit scores. This is a great way for you to get and control what's going on here. Total game changer. It's awesome. So you got to check it out. As I said, Experian.com slash MGG. The link will be in the show notes, of course. Our thanks to Experian for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, now that we are here, I want to take, uh, we had a couple of questions uh, essentially about doing things different than the Apple way. Uh, and I, really, I'll just get into it because it's way easier once we're there to, uh, to do this. And of course, I, I say that while I'm trying to find. So, Uh, Bob is asking about backups, right? He says, I've been using Time Machine Scheduler since a recommendation on your show. Probably Time Machine Editor is the one that that we uh, that we like because it lets you really control when Time Machine is going to happen and all that stuff. It's awesome. Uh, He says, I've noticed lately that I'm having trouble making reliable backups. I'm getting messages. The backup is damaged and a new one must be made. This happens on both uh, of my machines. For the last two and a half years, my network has been fundamentally the same. My internet modem feeds a Netgear Orbi router in my barn about 100 feet away through two drywall walls is the Orbi satellite that the airport extreme is then connected to with the hard drive hanging off of it and uh, via USB. Late last year, my longtime Seagate backup drive failed. I replaced it with a Western Digital Elements hard drive that will that never really worked reliably. So I returned it and replaced it with a MyBook hard drive. That seemed fine for a while until more file corruption issues started. In the case of both iMacs, new full backups were made, but both failed this past May. 
As a full backup takes over 30 hours, I'm not anxious to start a new set of them until I've figured out what is causing this file corruption. Do you think it could be Time Machine Editor, or is it more likely to be my home network or the WD drives? Is there a way to attach a backup, backup drive directly to the iMac, then relocate it to my barn and get Time Machine to find, recognize, and use that backup? It seemed that every time I tried to do that, it never really worked. Or... And this is the big question. Should I just abandon Time Machine, spend some cubic dollars and get a Synology? So what you're talking about, Bob, is what I would call normal Time Machine behavior. And it, it happens. We talk about it fairly frequently on the show because anything that's going over a Wi-Fi connection is likely more likely to cause a Time Machine network problem. Uh, Time Machine has no server component. Here, here's the issue, right? When you are backing up with Time Machine, your Mac that's running Time Machine is the only smart piece of the process, right? So your Mac is saying, I am going to take this file from my local drive and save it to this Time Machine backup uh, over here. Now, over here might be an external drive. Over here might be a drive across the network. Uh, your Mac certainly can know that and it does know that and it behaves differently. If it's a locally attached drive, it just saves it to a folder on that drive. If it's a network drive, it creates a disk image and saves it to a folder inside that disk image so that it can truly control uh, what the file structure looks like. So that answers your first question. No, you can't start it locally and then attach it to your uh, airport extreme that uh, you, I mean, there's a way, but it's it's not it's certainly not easy. The real problem, though, comes in when you're doing it to a drive over there because your Mac is the only thing writing files to that drive. So if your Mac's connection to that drive gets interrupted for any reason and, you know, Wi-Fi can can you know you can have interference you can have little things it doesn't take very long if it happens at exactly the right or wrong time for this to corrupt your backup which is why uh network time machine backups have always sort of been fraught with this kind of corruption add to that that it's inside a disk image which also requires some very careful sort of file management opening and closing things to make sure it works right and you will have uh, problems when backing up Time Machine over Wi-Fi. Uh, my Wi-Fi based computers generally have to have my Time Machine backups repaired once or twice a year. My wired ones like Ethernet wired ones tend to survive a lot longer. Uh, but I see those kind of go flaky, too. And it doesn't matter whether I'm backing up to a time capsule, an airport extreme, a Synology, a Drobo. It doesn't like it's. It's just time machine across the network. It doesn't matter what the destination is because the destination isn't acting smart in this case. You're not. What would be great is if you were passing files to a server engine on the destination and it was dealing with writing locally so that that way, if your connection got interrupted, like the management of this sparse bundle image would not get messed up. But that's not how time machine works. So uh, the type brand of network destination generally isn't a factor unless it's just a flaky piece of hardware or something. So there are other options. And, you know, you mentioned Synology in your question, Bob. Synology's drive, which is their uh, piece of software that lets you essentially create what, what I like to call your own Dropbox or your own iCloud drive ish kind of thing where you have a, a folder or, or set of folders that are synced from your Mac to the disk station. Of course, they can be synced to your phone and other Macs so that, you know, you can put a folder or a file or a folder in inside this folder and, and then it gets synced to everything. Uh, private cloud, at, you know, kind of at its finest. Synology Drive does one other thing and it has what they call uh, Synology Drive backup where it will take files and back them up across the network to your Synology. And this is done with a client server operation. Have you've messed with this, right, John? You've used Synology Drive before? Backup, mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah. Or it used to be called Cloud Station Backup until they changed the name of Cloud Cloud Station to Synology Drive. But are you still using Synology Drive Backup for some things? Um 
Yeah, I'm running. Let me look here in my menu bar. So I'm actually syncing one of my folders. Sure. Okay. So you're using it for sync. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are you, is it only sync? So you're not, you're not using the backup option. You're using uh, just the sync option. Is that right? Yeah, I'm syncing my, uh, so I sync my documents folder okay. using uh, Drive. Got it. Okay. And that is another type of, I mean, I, I know we're supposed to say that sync isn't backup, but, but it is, especially if it has like version control or versioning, which Synology Drive does. So, uh, so that's one way to do it. And then the other way is to just use, instead of a sync task, you can use a backup task, which is essentially a sync task in a one way uh, sort of setup, right? Because you're just going from you know your computer to the Synology. If something gets changed over there, it doesn't it it doesn't sync back. That's really the difference between sync and backup. My only issue with this, and I I started messing with this. It's really slow. Um, even sync is really slow because I think it only copies one file at a time. So it just takes a long time. It's very robust. It's very reliable. I've never had any problems with it, but you know, I I'll, we'll talk a little bit later. I I wound up doing some, uh, I rolled some computers around here, and so I had to resync my Synology Drive folder, which is, like is huge. I mean, it's you know, I don't know, fifteen gigs or twenty gigs or something like that, and it took way longer than it would have to just you know copy across the network with the Finder, where it uses you know parallel copies. So. Uh, so it is slow to do this Synology backup thing or or a Synology drive sync. But once once it's in place, then the individual files as you update them sort of happen very, very quickly because it's just one file at a time and, and that tends to work. So, yeah. Have you had any issues with Synology drive sync, John? Uh, none that I can tell. Yeah. Yeah. So I would be, you know, so this is one option I, and it's it's certainly the one that John and I use. Uh, you know, certainly more reliable than Time Machine. I also still do Time Machine across the network. I just have accepted that, you know, a couple times a year, I, I need to let it wipe it out and start over again. And and that it's not universally true. You know, I might have a machine that goes eighteen months before that needs to happen. But um, but I it I just I don't I don't worry about the years and years of Time Machine history like. Um, like I was originally trained to do by Apple's marketing team. Uh, I, I worry about that differently now. So, yeah. So I'm curious if anybody out there has any other solutions for, you know, a local, you know, a local network backup that is more robust for you than time machine. Uh, time Machine's really nice. Don't get me wrong in that. It's definitely the easiest backup I've ever recovered anything from, right? Because it's super easy to navigate the recovery interface and all of that. It just, uh, it's just not robust for network backups, which is unfortunate, but that's how it goes. So I'm curious, feedback at MackieCab.com if you have any, uh, any, any, uh, any thoughts to share. Did you say feedback at MackieCab.com? You know, I did, John, say feedback at MackieCab.com. It's true. That's true. Do you have anything more to uh, to add to this conversation before we move on to uh, Ed? Yes. Um, one thing you may want to consider is making a backup of your backup. <clears throat> so you do this. So right? I back up the contents of one of my Synology, Synologies, to my other Synology. And that includes the time machine file. So if your time machine gets corrupted, you can just restore a previous backup and maintain Correct. your history. Right. So if it gets, yeah. So the thing is, uh, though I haven't had to do this for a while. It, it's been amazingly stable. Um, That's both good. wireless and wired. Yeah. So one of my machines, so my mini is wired and my, my MacBook, uh, I typically do it uh, over uh wi-fi sure but sure. um but yeah i haven't had that problem for a while but when it did report corruption i'm like oh well let me just go to yesterday's let me just restore yesterday's time machine image and um and then it did it again and you know it tried it again and and uh and everything was fine so whoa so you may want to consider that make a backup of your backup hmm 
So I have a, this is brilliant, man. You're, you're like totally blowing my mind because you could do this even if you only had one Synology because Synology's BTRFS file system now supports snapshots like APFS does. And it would stand to reason that you could set up snapshots on your time yeah, yeah. machine volume. And then you don't then like the restoration is instant. Dude, this is hmm. brilliant. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, I like this, John. Let's see, this is it. This is the, these are the moments of brilliance for Mr. John F. Braun, folks. So I like this, man. What a great idea. Yeah, yeah. So not all backup destinations are created equal because if you've got a backup of your backup in, in one way, shape, or form, you're in great shape. Huh. I like it, man. This is now see, I learned something. Like this is huge. I can't like I I I'm eager to like pause the recording of the show and go turn on snapshots <laughs> on my my time machine volume on my uh, on my Synology, but I will I will maintain composure. Yeah, I haven't I haven't actually done anything with snapshots as of I started messing with it. Um, but it's very simple. You uh, you go into your you know DSM interface, right? And look look at me not having to pause the show to do this. And you go to I think you go into Control Panel Shared Folder, and then you edit the shared folder there. And I think this is where you can no 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 you don't do it there. You do it in snapshot replication i don't know there's a place to do this um yeah you go into to so the main menu and there's an app called snapshot replication you go into that and then s select your uh shared folder and you can go to so for me i'm selecting my time machine folder i go to settings and i say enable sl snapshot schedule and I can say daily at midnight. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I can choose how long to retain them. That so I can retain by as many as will fit, or a uh, you know a, a fixed amount of snapshots. I mean, I'm going to set it to a hundred. I don't need more than I don't need thousands of these. And um, and then there you go. And then you say okay, and that's it boom so now i didn't i didn't have to pause the show and i didn't have to wait till later and i was able to maintain my composure and perhaps teach somebody something so there you go and i'm going to tell it to take a snapshot now first snapshot because i can and then say okay and now boom it's taken a snapshot of my time machine volume right there on my yeah, so uh, where's this again? station Yep. So go to main menu snapshot replication. It's a it's an app like package center or control panel or file station or anything like that. All right. I don't see that app here. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, perhaps it's something that needs to be installed. Maybe it's not installed by default. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll check it out. I can uninstall it. So that would indicate that. Yes, I think there are other ways to manage snapshots. I don't think this is the only way, but um, but oh, certainly. yeah, there we go. I just searched for an app and there's an app here called snapshot replication. Well, let me install yep. it now Play with it later. Snapshot replicate just to to keep any confusion from happening. Snapshot replication is a different feature. Um it's just that the app allows you to manage your local snapshots on your on your volumes. But what snapshot replication does is lets you back up your snapshots to a different disk station. So this would be this would be your new way of backing things up, John. You do snapshots locally and then you would say, OK, I want backups of these over there on that other disk station. And now you'd run snapshot replication to do that. That's that's kind of how that's supposed to work, which is very confusing to me. But. Uh, that they bake all this stuff sort of in the same app, but you know, mm -hmm. th there you go. That's how it goes. Sweet. Oh, I love this. This is why we do this show because we love this stuff, folks. All right. Uh, let's see. Ed. Ed has a question. He says, uh, I signed up for family sharing of iCloud storage. Uh, we now we are currently on the 200 gig plan. I've tried to figure out how to create a folder on iCloud drive that can be shared 
with the family members to no avail. It appears that we can share uh, the expense, but not actual data. We can just share the storage. Am I doing something wrong? I want to remove our dependence on Dropbox because it has become a pain since they changed the rules to only three devices. If there is no iCloud folder sharing solution, do you recommend a Dropbox alternative? So you're right that iCloud doesn't allow folder sharing yet, but it's coming in iPad OS 13, Mac OS Catalina, iOS 13 in the fall. So if you can wait, you can have this via iCloud, which is great. Um, as long as everyone is support is running a supported operating system. I, I'm not sure how it's going to work. If like, you've got somebody that, that has to be running, say, you know, high Sierra and, and can't be on this. So uh, in the meantime, or alternatively, Google drive allows this right now. So that's a freely available solution. Uh, you only get, I think 15 gigs of storage for free, but, but that might be enough depending on what you want to share. Uh, with the family Synology drive, which we just mentioned also does this too. If you have a disk station to run it. And I believe some others support this too. Boxnet comes to mind, but I haven't used that much. Um, perhaps John, you have any thoughts on other options for this? I, I don't like to share. So, right. <clears throat> I haven't, ex I have not explored this issue. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yep. Well, I mean, but you have, right? Because you and I share a folder for Mac Geek Cab over Dropbox. Right. Right. Which um, which I'm thinking about, we should move to Synology Drive, but because that way, just for the same reasons as Ed, reducing Dropbox dependence. But, um, you know, there you go. So, But iCloud Drive folder sharing would be a diff another way to do this, which, you know, is perhaps easier... It, for you, it wouldn't matter because you're already running Synology Drive on your Macs, right? Um, but uh, but there you go. So, yeah. Oh, another option. Man, I always forget about this, too, is um, what previously was called BitTorrent Sync, but is called Resilio Sync. And the cool part about Resilio Sync is it requires no server. Uh, you just set up the Resilio Sync client on all of your Macs and or iOS devices and they just find each other locally or over the internet and sync with each other. So your folder can be as big as you want it to be, as long as everybody has enough actual local storage to store it. So Resilio Sync might be another option for you. So there you go. More thoughts on that, John? Anything before we move on? Continue. Continue. <laughs> um, Let's continue. Okay. <clears throat> I, I want to take a minute and talk about, I, I alluded to this a few minutes ago. I rolled some Macs around. So uh, as some of you may have seen earlier this week, Apple finally put their 2019 iMacs on the uh, refurb store, which is what I've been waiting for. Because here in the studio, I had that 2011 iMac. Down in the office, I had a 2014, the first of the Retina 5K iMacs. Now, thankfully, I had bought uh, that knowing that I would probably keep it for a very long time. So I bought the high-end CPU on that, which is the uh, 4 gigahertz i7. Uh, and 4-core, you know, great. So uh, as soon as they went live on the store, I happened to catch it. I, I don't know why I happened to look. It was just, I just had a, I was actually, I was with my family. They were watching, we were watching some show that I didn't care about. And I'm like, ah, you know, it seems like it might be time. What, what does it look like? I was like, oh, crap, there they are. So I ordered one and I ordered an i9. So the high end CPU, I was able to order it uh, with. It's really weird that the options that you that that are possible for the uh, 2019 IMAX. And of course, not all of them are available uh, at any one time on the refurb store. You have to kind of sift through and find what you're looking for. But um there's four different graphics cards that you can get. And each of the, the th one of them is only a build to order option. The other three are tied to the CPU that you start with, even though you can build to order, upgrade your CPU and still live with an older graphics card. So I wound up getting uh, the core I nine, which is the, the top end CPU, eight core CPU with uh, eight gigs of Ram 
the 580x graphics card which is the 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 it's not the total top end because i don't need that but uh but i got you know whatever that one was 580x and a one terabyte ssd which is great because i was able for 128 bucks to buy another 32 gigs of ram uh crucial ram via amazon and that worked out really really well so uh so it's got 40 gigs of ram in it uh, uh, a terabyte ssd internal which is double what i had previously so more than i need and more graphics card than i need and more cpu than i need so what i did john was i thought okay um my plan and i and and in retrospect i think i would do this plan differently uh but my plan was okay well i'll put the new imac in the office and i'll take the office imac and put that up in the studio and then i can decommission this older 2011 imac so that's what i did it, and i want to talk through that process in retrospect i don't i i only did that process because it it's what i've always done i put the new my new machine in the office roll the old one up to the studio that old machine, the 2014, you know, 5K, four core i7 is plenty fast for me in the office. And having this new eight core machine in the office, I notice literally no difference whatsoever. So I probably should have just put the, the new machine up here in the studio, but I didn't. And I'm also noticing no like speed problems here in the studio. So maybe it really doesn't matter. But when I'm doing like like music recording with multi-tracks and all that stuff, I might want the extra CPU up here. So I might wind up switching things around. But for now, that's what I did, which meant I was rolling two computers basically simultaneously. And that is a lot to think about. So I thought, okay, the studio one, I have not nuke and paved this machine up here since before we started Mac Geek Gab. I mean, I've put new machines in place, but I've always just run Migration Assistant. I thought, you know, it's time. Uh, this should be done. So that was the decision for this one. And being that I needed to do two of these sort of simultaneously, I decided the one in the office that's been nuke and paved relatively recently. I can just Migration Assistant to my, you know, the new machine there. And, and that's fine. So that went that went fairly well. It went fairly slowly only because I... Uh, do not follow my own advice. And I clone to uh, a rotational drive that's not terribly fast. And so it took, you know, I don't know, it took uh, several hours to, you know, to clone everything back. Uh, I, I think I posted online, John, you saw that, you know, at one point it was reporting it was going to take 18 hours to to clone or to migrate my apps over. It didn't take quite that long. It took maybe three. Uh, but Migration Assistant is slow. Like Synology Drive, it copies one file at a time. There's no parallelization like there is in the Finder. So when it gets to all the like tiny little files that I installed for, say, Homebrew or whatever, it takes a very, very, very long time. Uh, but it it moved much faster than the 18 hours it reported. So, uh, so that machine's fine. Up here in the studio, I I started earlier this week. Um, I start. I did two things. I started making a list of all the apps that I wanted to have on here because there's a lot of moving parts. Like all, you know, I use Audio Hijack and Farago and Discord and Loopback and you know my IRC client. All the things that I need to do to record this show. Uh, the other thing that I did on both computers was that I ran Carbon Copy Cloner and I cloned my drive to a disk image on the Synology. So no matter what happens. In, you know, quote unquote, cold storage, I have those images to refer back to. And that gave me the peace of mind to do whatever I need to do and uh, and, you know, mess with it with the system. So um, so there you go that uh, so with that in, in mind, I, I wiped the drive up here and I uh, or I moved the computer from the office up to here and I installed Mojave Fresh. Then. I set up my user account from scratch, got it all working. Uh, everything was fine. It took a little while, but not as never as long as I think that the whole nuke and pave thing is not nearly as scary as, as I always think it's going to be. It took, I don't know, a few hours and I was back in business with pretty much everything that I needed. Um, you know, I, I having that list uh, of things in that list was something I wrote on paper so that I had it without a computer being live, which was helpful. Uh, 
But yeah, you know, just kind of crossing things off the list. I put one password and Synology Drive and Text Expander on first so that I'd kind of have all the things that I needed and software licenses and all that. I put Setapp on very early in the process to kind of pull the apps in that I use that way. And, and you know, it, it, went, it went relatively fine. Um, and then, John, I had to stop and think uh, because I'm not the only person that uses this machine. I have, in fact, four different user accounts on this computer, one for me, and that's the one that I built from scratch. Then my wife, Lisa, does a lot of our accounting and, and actually lots of other stuff for us here at, at Mac Observer and Backbeat Media. And this is her work computer when I'm not podcasting. And I started thinking about what a nuke and pave was going to mean for her and thought, man, OK, right. Got to deal with that. And then there's the whole concept of nuking and paving the other two accounts, which are basically used for the same purpose, which is audio recording. I have separate accounts for that so that I can give those passwords to like other band members and they can come into the studio when I'm not here, if they want to mix some things or whatever. And I thought, you know, those accounts, I don't want to mess with those either. I thought, wait a minute, John F. Braun, he always reminds me that migration assistant has some granularity. So after I nuke and paved and got the machine all set up the way I wanted and got my user account set from scratch manually the way that I wanted, then I launched Migration Assistant and pointed it only at those three user accounts. I unchecked the applications. I unchecked system settings. I unchecked network setting, like all of that stuff. The other files, whatever that is, I unchecked and, yeah, and, and just had it copy those user accounts in. And it did. And then I logged into Lisa's and there were two apps that I knew that I had not installed that she would need to use. One was QuickBooks and the other is Yojimbo that she actually still uses for all her notes. And um, I wanted to, I did not install those prior to setting up or prior to migrating her user account because I wanted to make sure it didn't try to bring in those apps, you know, just because they were, say, in her dock or whatever. And it did not like those apps were not there. And it was like, great. Okay. And then I just installed them and, and the data files that, you know, she uses and that we sync and all that stuff were totally fine. Uh, made life really, really easy. So this hybrid migration approach really worked well. And it made me think, you know, you could do that even with your own user account. Um, you could, you know, you could, um, not migrate apps in, but just migrate your user account in. And, you know, if you wanted to kind of sort of nuke and pave that, that would potentially give you, you know, some, some cruft cleaning, not all of it. Cause you'd still have whatever's in your user account, but yeah, there you go. So, so yeah, nuke and pave, but not nuke and pave, but like everything I'm using is, is new uh, for me. And I, you know, I had to kind of set it all up and again, it's fine. It seems to be working. If you folks are hearing the show success. So any thoughts about that, John? <clears throat> when the time comes, I think I'm going to use migration assistant. Okay. When was the last time you nuke and paved either of your machines? Has it, <laughs> has it, it's been a while, huh? <laughs> yes. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I realized that, um, and I mean, I've known this for a while, but as I started thinking about it, sort of the, the data point that that stuck out in my head was that the folder to which I have Audio Hijack saving our audio files for every podcast, you know, when we record, it has to save to a folder somewhere, was a folder on my desktop named Test. So that was the thing that made me realize, yeah... This is from like before Mac Geek Gab ever started because test is test, you know, like testing this whole idea of maybe doing a podcast someday. So, yeah, it was time and I feel pretty good about it. It's it's been pretty good. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So anyway, I just figured I'd share that experience. It was um it less honestly, the biggest pain point that I had was I created my boot disk. You no, know, I created a USB boot stick for um, 
for, uh, uh, you know, with Mojave on it. Right. Um, and I did it by running an app called disc maker X, which is what I've always used in the past. And I pointed disc maker X to a Mojave installation that I had downloaded like last month, knowing that this was probably going to come. And I wanted to grab as, as I mentioned on the show and it's good advice, go download a copy of the Mojave installer. Now you get 10.14.5 and it's way easier to do now than it is after Catalina launches. It's still possible after Catalina launches. It's just not as easy. So I had the latest one. It was sitting there on my disk station because I put it in cold storage and I pointed disk maker 10 at it, disk maker X, whatever you want to call it. And it was like, yeah, no problem. And it built the disk and the, the, the built the USB stick and the USB stick worked. Like it booted my machine. I ran disk utility. It was fine. I wiped my drive. Great. Then I said, great, install. And it's like the installer can't be run. It gave me that error that you get when the the time is wrong on your machine. So I checked to make sure that like somehow the, the clock hadn't reset to like, you know, 1999 or something. No, it had not. Time was fine. It truly was corrupt on this thing. So I had to go and rebuild the USB stick and, and all of that stuff. I don't know why it was a problem, uh, but I did it from, uh, I, I re-downloaded a copy of the Mojave installer and did it from my local drive and, uh, and that worked fine. So, you know, buyer beware just, but that, that, that was the thing that slowed me, that kind of tripped me up, but otherwise everything went really, really smoothly, at least so far. We'll see. All right, more thoughts, John? Anything? Huh. Why didn't you use create install media? So you're right, because that's part of um I, because disk I had Disk Maker 10 and it's mm-hmm. a click in the in the graphic interface instead of having to use the terminal. Um that, okay. that's why. But when I um when I did it the second time, I did not use Disk Maker 10. I used Create Install Media, which is there's an Apple Knowledge Base article. We'll put a uh, we'll put a link in the show notes mm-hmm. for it. But that's you know Apple's sort of official way. But you have to do it from the terminal. And I was just being you know efficient. I thought I was being efficient about it. I clearly was not. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's why. So yeah, maybe I, I I clearly made the wrong choice. Though I I don't think there's anything wrong with Disk Maker 10. I think it was the image i think it was trying to do it from my across the network from my disk station uh, that maybe I don't, know, I, don't know. I don't know but yes i did create install media the second time that worked much better so there you go but i also downloaded a fresh copy just in case so any more thoughts <clears throat> nope okay we have uh we have some cool stuff found to share does that sound good john can I do that now? Absolutely. Sweet. Actually, first, I want to talk about our sponsor, Cashfly, at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Actually, Mac dot Cashfly dot com is where you want to go because the good people at Cashfly are going to provide you with a free optimization consultation for your website so you can learn exactly where your website stands today they'll give you your lighthouse score report and of course they'll tell you how cashfly's web optimization solutions can help add more points to your lighthouse score at mac.cashfly.com because the reality is when websites don't load we lose interest for each second a page takes to load It costs a company 16% in engagement. Fewer visitors means fewer customers. That's not good for any of us. And Cashfly has your back. They've had our back here at Mac Geek Cab for almost all of our 14 years. And now they have your back too with that new web optimization capability that I just mentioned. All your content can be optimized before it's delivered to visitors without requiring any development efforts from you. Application load balancing, on-the-fly next-gen image optimization, all kinds of smart asset delivery, just like we're doing with our podcasts to you. You can use this too. So go check it out. Mac.cashfly.com, M-A-C dot C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com. Go check it out. And our thanks to Cashfly 
for sponsoring this episode and also providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. All righty. So I said cool stuff found. We'll start with Bruce. And Bruce says, uh, in episode 769 last week, Bill wrote in about noise-canceling earbuds. You listed two alternatives, the Ear and M2s and the Pioneer Rays. I would suggest a third, the Isotunes Pro Bluetooth Noise Isolating Earbuds from isotunesaudio.com. Link, of course, in the show notes. I learned about these at a woodworking conference. These are OSHA-compliant hearing protectors with a noise reduction rating of 27 decibels. I listened to them briefly and they seemed to work fairly well. They sounded good enough that I purchased a set on site at the conference. I just pulled them out of the box and am listening to a recording of Box Passacaglia. Passacaglia, sorry, and Fugue in C minor, and they seem to cover a wide frequency range. The pedal is surprisingly full and the highs are clean and crisp. Not a scientific review, I know, but good enough for my ears, he says. Uh, they come with four different pairs of foam ear tips and one pair of those triple flanged uh, silicone ear tips. List price is eighty nine ninety nine. He says, I've seen them on the web for as low as seventy one ninety nine. So very cool. Yeah, that I hadn't I, I never even thought about OSHA compliant Bluetooth earbuds. But there you go. Great stuff. Very good stuff. Uh. I have a cool stuff found in the in the same range that I tested out this week. John Optoma uh, has been making earbuds for a little while. Their latest ones, their new forest B free six earbuds. These are uh, they fit right in your ear. There's nothing that hangs like down or out. There's no cords. They are completely wireless uh, for ninety nine bucks. They pair really easily. They have their own charging case, which is great. Uh, they will support Bluetooth 5. Uh, they support AAC, which is Apple's tech for sending high quality audio to Bluetooth. And it works really, really well. I've, I've, been, I, I've been messing with them and they've been great. They, six hours of battery life. Uh, with the earbuds and then three more charges uh, or an additional 18 hours through the charging base. So, and, and it's got like the, the, the case actually shows you like how they're charged. I've been messing with them. You know, my favorite test is to put earbuds in and, and play my drums because that tells me how much they're isolating the outside world. I had to mess around like, like, uh, like the other ones we mentioned, these come with a, bunch of different sizes of uh of silicone tips and so i had to find the right ones to to really lock into my ear and and seal but they work great um and charging is uh is via a usb c cable but of course you can plug it into a usb a port to get charging but it's got a usb c port on it so that uh yeah it's you know moving forward not no more micro usb just usb c so i've been i'm, I'm actually really impressed by these um uh, for 99 bucks they you know it's a it's a decent price for what you're getting nice sealed if you're on an airplane you wouldn't hear you know the outside noise and and all that stuff so yeah very good stuff so i'm i'm stoked about them so i figured i want to or i didn't figure i wanted to share that so there we go any thoughts on that john before we keep moving on moving on moving on to well a, a sort of a related tip from bob um he was we had an email trail going about airpods and he says that he uses his airpods while cycling uh, and i asked him how he felt about that like uh first of all you know falling out no problems with that uh which i have also been amazed by that i just can't get these things to fall out of my ears you know, one of the nice parts about AirPods that I find, at least when walking around in, you know, crowded environments is I can still hear people when they're talking to me. And uh, and he says, yeah, he also finds even on a bike that he can hear, you know, when another cyclist is coming and saying on your left or whatever, or certainly the noise of cars coming at him um, or behind him or from wherever he has no trouble hearing any of that. And so he is able to maintain situational awareness while having even two earbuds in. So, uh, so there you go. So, uh, you know, obviously always be careful when, when cycling, but I was 
really glad to hear that uh, that Bob was able to has seems to have no trouble with that. So thank you for sharing that, Bob. Good stuff. Thoughts, my friend, before moving on. <clears throat> nope, it's a uh, safety first. Safety first, indeed. All right. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Let's go to. Um, let's answer some more questions because uh, because that's fun. It seems to be a, a thing. It seems to be a thing that we do here, John. Uh, Nathan has a question. He says, I've been using Google Photos for the past few years, and I recently upgraded my iCloud storage. I have yet to find a good method to transfer my Google Photos to iCloud Photos, and any insight would be extremely helpful. Okay, so there are a few options. I am not the order in which I am going to talk through these or we are going to talk through these is not indicative of which I certainly think is the best. I don't know that there is, I don't know which way is the best. Maybe we'll come to a consensus here, John. So the first is use Google takeout at takeout.google.com. Um, this allows you, this is actually a, a handy thing because it allows you to download all of the data that you have stored in Google. Uh, so takeout.google.com, you can go there. If all you want is your photos, deselect everything on this page and then only select uh, Google photos. Uh, that'll download them down into a, a folder. And then you could just, you know, drag that folder into the photos app, which will upload them to iCloud uh, sort of by nature, as long as you've attached photos to your iCloud photo library, obviously that, that that's sort of a prerequisite or a post requisite could be done after the fact. doesn't really matter. Um, Another way uh, is I've I found an article at Gizmodo that that actually talks through a lot of this stuff and is a handy article. I will I will put uh, that link in the show notes for sure. But uh, the the article is called How to Move Your Photo Library Between Apple Photos and Google Photos, and the section of it titled Switching from Google Photos to Apple Photos uh, talks about a few different things. Um, and uh, you can use the Google Drive app to bring down your photos. You have to tell Google Drive to include your photos in the sync that it brings down. So Google Drive is th their Dropbox-esque app, right, where you can just sync a folder. Well, you can have it populate that folder with your Google Photos as well. You just have to go into your Google settings, your Google Drive settings, and check a box that says automatically put your Google photos into a folder in my drive. And then boom, there they are. And then again, from there, drag them over and put them on your Mac. Um, another way to do it is you can do it directly from the web uh, by just going to photos.google.com and download from there. Sorry about the little hiccup here. I know no hiccup for you folks listening, except I'm going to be a little out of sorts because we just spent about five minutes troubleshooting a weird audio problem again. Same one as last week with the static, uh, which we switched from using Firewire to USB this time. I don't know. Doesn't really make sense, but uh, we shall see if this continues to work. I hope it does. I hope, I hope. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm not really a fan of USB audio, but if uh, if that's how it goes. Anyway, uh, Google Takeout. So, yeah, uh, no, sorry, not Google Takeout. Uh, Google Photos. Yeah, you can just download from the web to a folder and good to go. Uh, and then the final option that I came up with, John, is you can do it with your phone. This actually seems to be the first option a lot of people suggest. But, man, it seems like this would be the slowest way to do it. Um, you know, and, uh, and the way that you would do this is, um, let me, let me get us, let me get there. Let me get myself back in business here. But, uh, yeah, the way that you would do it is you run Google photos on your phone and, uh, and then you, and then have it copy those to your phone's photo library and then up it'll go. 
man, like, I don't know. That seems, seems like it would take forever. It would be over Wi-Fi. It would require you to like slurp all that stuff down to your phone, which your phone might not fit. So it would have to do it in chunks. Like, uh, man, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Mr. Braun? <sighs> My one concern with all of these is maintaining uh, a library, like like, like your albums. albums. Yeah, is how 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 would that stuff migrate at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Let's talk that through a little bit. How would how would you do it? What would if you wanted to maintain albums? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm thinking like if if you go to photos.google.com and you you can see your albums there, right? So you could theoretically like just you know, download an album at a time. Maybe I I have not tried this, but it's possible that Google Takeout would organize your photos into folders by album. So maybe yeah, and actually, yeah. So if I go to photos.google.com, which I don't use that. Sure, sure. I do see albums on the, uh, yeah. yes, I do see an albums category. Okay. So but that would be my concern yeah, moving totally. between any photo services is how do you maintain your structure? Because uh, people spend a lot of time creating albums. So uh, they absolutely. Find their stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd hate to lose that. So, yeah, that it, that's interesting. Like, I do, I will create albums for things, but I, I do it less and less now um, only because uh, it, it, things are so good at creating, you know, moments or memories or, you know, Google's assistant or, you know, whatever it, your particular photo engine of choice calls it. Um, it's not, you know, it's not... Um, it, it's not as necessary to create like, like the, I, I used to create annual albums and those sorts of things. Those are gone. Right. And even albums by location, it tries to do them by events, but you know, obviously it can't always guess that quite right. Um, so yeah, yeah, no albums are still, still a thing, perhaps less of a thing than they used to be. So, yeah. All right. Any more on, uh, on this one, John, before we uh, move on to the next question. I okay. I really like that takeout.google.com site. That's pretty cool. I had, I had not known about that. And actually, it's kind of creepy, all the stuff they list there. It's like, wait, you know that? Yeah. I mean, it's pages you know and me? pages of data that's on here. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little crazy. Yep. Um, oh, there it is. All photo albums included. Yeah, you get to pick that when you're doing your photos. So that huh. would that would Great. be um I think that would potentially solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't tried this cuz I that would be a massive amount of data to slurp down, but um yeah, there you go. Yep. Hopefully it's still organized by album when you bring it down, but that would be the only the only question. So Cool. All right. Uh, let's see while we're on the subject of media and moving it around, let's go to Eduardo here, uh, who asks, he says, I have two Macs, a big 27 inch retina iMac, uh, with lots of storage and a 13 inch non-touch bar MacBook pro with only 128 gigs of storage. I'm the only user of both. So I never use them at the same time. The iMac, uh, is for work at the home office and the MacBook for when I'm on the road. Since last month, my job includes a lot of video editing in iMovie. I separated the library between a ongoing folder and a finished folder, so I would not need to load all of those things every time I fired up iMovie. Considering that I'm the only user of both machines and I'm fully aware of the risks of opening the same file at the same time on different machines, would you say that it's safe to use iCloud Drive to keep the library in sync between the machines? So this is a good question. My first, my gut feeling was, yeah, it should work. Um, as long as you're aware of the, the, the true dangers of trying to open the same thing. And as long as you are like the biggest thing that I find, we sync our QuickBooks data uh, between several computers here. 
and we don't run multi-user QuickBooks. Uh, we might, but uh, but we don't currently because we don't really need to. But we have several companies, so we can't use QuickBooks Online in a cost-effective uh, manner. Uh, so we we use the desktop version, which is fine, and it it runs really well. Uh, we have using Synology Drive. We have a shared folder that uh, that we use to share our I think five different uh, QuickBooks data files. And the only time we run into trouble is if someone opens a file that is not finished syncing. Like let's say Synology Drive had quit, um, you know, or whatever. So and Synology Drive is kind of like Dropbox, where in the Finder it will put a uh, you know a, it puts a green checkbox, but it it has there are labels visible right there in the Finder that show you is the file synced, is it actively syncing or is Synology drive not running? And there is no little icon. So uh, we make sure the icons there and that the icon is green. And that tells us, yep, we're all good to go. And now we can open it. Of course, QuickBooks uh, for desktop has an automated backup function where it automatically backs up when you quit and all that. So we have that too, just in case we ever er make an error. So that my, my gut on this says that if you did that with iMovie and we're just really intentional about making sure syncing was finished and happening, you'd be okay. But you know, there's that whole media browser thing that happens in, uh, in Mac OS. And that feels like a thing that's sort of live all the time. So I don't know if that would muck with this. I, it's certainly worth an experiment, but, your iMovie stuff might be open by things that are not iMovie. So even if iMovie is not running, that whole media browser thing that exists might still have it in there. I don't know. I haven't messed with it enough to, to know that. But, um, but maybe, I don't know. But what do you think, John? Oh, I haven't. <clears throat> launched iMovie in ages yeah See, they've been updating it yeah 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 of course yeah, yeah I just ran it here it's like hey welcome to iMovie <laughs> it's like oh you haven't run me ever <laughs> yeah 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 so I think I think that I you know again it, you know you're aware that's the that's the trick right just know that you might run into trouble make like clones of clones and backups of backups and you know, I think, I think you'll be all right. I think so. Uh, we have time for Scott. Yeah, sure. We have time for Scott. Let's, uh, let's, let's try this. I don't know that we have an answer for Scott, but we have time for Scott. Scott says there appears to be some dispute between different apps about how much open disk space, free disk space I have available. Um, I've attached some screenshots that show uh, on the desktop highlighting the drive says I have 275 gigs available. iStat menu shows 500 gigs when running Daisy disc. It shows a very large difference when looking at the main display between normal and hidden. He says I've used Daisy disc to attempt to delete purgeable space as it calls it, but it doesn't seem to change what my uh, is reported on my desktop. I've used my carbon copy cloner backup. Uh, and based on that, I'm only using about 500 gigs of a one terabyte drive. So there should be approximately 500 gigs available, but the finder shows 280. So which one of these available space or free numbers is correct? And why do they differ? Uh, we've run into this before, Mr. Braun. What do you think about this? Uh, what was the, the I think local snapshots there are some categories of yes files that one mechanism considers used space and yep. the other doesn't and i think local snapshots was was one of them that causes a discrepancy though i mean this one i'm yeah you got me i mean yeah it could be it could be local snapshots 200 and it could be just having a lot of snapshots there. Yep. I don't know. No, and that is one place to check. You know, unfortunately, Apple doesn't make it easy to see what's in those lo local snapshots. Carbon Copy Cloner does. So you could use Carbon Copy Cloner to look at those local snapshots. Um, 
because it's just because it's it's right there. You can also do it. I think there's ways with the command line, of course, to see it. But um, but uh, but snapshots, snapshots, like we mentioned in that section about Synology earlier, you know, they're a really, really easy um, thing to use to get that sort of local quick backup uh, happening. It's not quite a backup, but it's sort of a backup. But yeah, it could be those. Um, it could be log files, things that the system kind of holds separately. Um, Daisy disk is usually pretty good at finding those though. It, you know, when it shows you hidden files, dig into that and click on that and go deeper with Daisy disk and see what it says in there, because that can, that can be the, you know, it, it sometimes can tell you sometimes it doesn't, uh, Clean My Mac also has something called Space Lens that I have found uh, very, very handy in terms of finding what's being used on my uh, on my system. So I'll, we'll put we'll put links to all that. But those those are kind of the three. But I, and I think I, based on you know some other emails that I've had with Scott, I don't think it's any of those are showing him uh, where this is happening, which is sort of maddening and. And I don't know where else to tell him to look. If anybody does, let us know, please. It would be good. It would be really good. Any more thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Yeah. Yeah. Did you link to this uh, about Time Machine local snapshot? No, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I found a, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in there. Okay. But they actually have a section here saying how local snapshots use storage space. Oh, there you go. Okay. That's great. That's great. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Um, a couple other cool stuff's found to jump to because why not? It's what we do. Greg, um, follow up from 769. Greg says, you probably already have this app, but since you don't scan that much, perhaps only once a year, he was replying to my, my, uh, me lamenting that my, uh, scanner, my HP scanner software was, is not going to work with Catalina. Um, he says an awesome program is scanner pro by Riedel. And, uh, he says you can, your, it makes your iPhone into your scanner. You can even pull down on the screen and select a new folder to drag things, different folders, or you can start a scan while you're in a folder and it will put it there automatically. He says it's pretty great and works amazingly well. So thanks, Greg. That's, uh, that's good. Yeah. More, more options to, to, uh, to do that with. I, um, I was asking actually on, on both Twitter and Facebook uh, and really trying to kind of pull my iOS developer friends to see if there's an answer to my question. And there's not, you know, how on the Mac, when things are running slowly, you go and launch activity monitor to see what process is chewing up all the CPU or maybe using up lots of Ram or whatever it is. I want to do that on iOS sometimes, right? Just general troubleshooting phones being slow, being weird. Okay. What's using resources ever since iOS 10, Apple has limited third party apps ability to show you this. There is a Unix command. It exists. Actually, there's two of them. They exist on both your Mac and on iOS. I think they both exist on Mac and iOS, but one of them does. It's called top or H top. I actually like H top. It, lays things out a little bit better, but top is essentially the same view that activity monitor shows you lists, your processes shows CPU usage. It can show Ram usage and things like that. I want to run top on my iPhone. Nobody seems to be able to point me to a way to be able to do that other than jailbreaking, of course, which is just ridiculous because the only thing that Apple provides is in settings battery and that lies. So, you know, there you go. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, in asking this though, Ty, uh, over on Facebook pointed out a piece of software that I had not seen before. It doesn't show you this because it can't because Apple won't let it be in the app store if it does, but it shows you a lot of information. It's called Lirum info. L I R U M is Lirum and then info. And I'll put a link to it. They have a light and a light version for free. And then a pro version, which I think is just like three bucks or something. And uh, Lirum device info is there in the in the store and shows you all kinds of cool things about your uh, iPhone. So I will um, 
I'll put a link to this in the show notes. It's uh, definitely worthy as a cool stuff found, and I'm happy to have it on my on my phone. So pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. Any thoughts on that before we keep moving on? Uh oh, John. Do you do you have to go? Uh, fire engine. Okay, that's good. Uh in addition to the other toys that I mentioned that I got this week, I finally got my order of wise bulbs, W Y Z E. I had pre ordered these. A pack of four Wi-Fi smart bulbs, twenty nine ninety nine plus like five or six bucks shipping. So nine dollars a bulb is essentially what I paid uh, for these Wi-Fi bulbs. They work with the Amazon A Lady with Google uh, Assistant, and they work with Ift. So you can basically tie it into anything except HomeKit uh, if you want. Wise is the company that's out there. Uh, they. they <laughs> I'm just going to turn you down for a second. Um, Wise is the company that's out there saying that they are going to democratize the smart home by keeping things affordable. And, you know, they were the ones with those $20, you know, HD cameras, Wi-Fi cameras that you can put in your house. And now they've got their bulbs and they have some motion sensors, too. And, man, I am blown away by these things. They're their brightness and uh, color temperature. So your white point temperature is totally controllable with these. You can group them together. Uh, you know, you can have them linked to your uh, Amazon a lady routines and all of that stuff. And, and to answer Mac Vader's question in our chat room at Mac slash stream. Yes, it is Wi-Fi like without a hub for sure. It just connects to your Wi-Fi router. It uses that same thing that we talked about uh, in the beginning of the show with, uh, with Domenico's, um, quick tip, but you connect to its Wi-Fi network. And then from there you tell it about yours and how to log into yours. And then it logs into yours and you're good to go. So nine bucks a bulb. Great, great things. I have found having smart bulbs indoors is, is good. Um, and there are rooms in which it's great to be able to change the color temperature at different times of day and that sort of thing. Having them outside is life changing. All the, the bulbs like in front of my front door and in my driveway and all that stuff, having those automatically come on at sundown and then, you know, turn off at midnight and then having it triggerable by my motion sensor. You know, my motion sensor has a light on it, but I want the rest of the lights to turn on if there's motion. And so I can with, you know, an ift recipe or, an, a, you know, Amazon routine or whatever. It really having smart bulbs is is one of those. It. Smart bulbs and that um, that Eufy robot vacuum that I have uh, from Anchor, those are the two. That thing is like life changing as well. You know, having the house vacuumed every morning when I wake up is uh, is fantastic. So smart bulbs outside, vacuum inside. This will change your smart home life. So, uh, but yeah. Anyway, wanted to point out those bulbs. Great price. Great, great price. Are you using any? Any like you're using some smart bulbs that link to your hub, right, John? Yes. So I have the first ones I got, which still work, yep. uh, were the GE Link bulbs. Oh, right. Yep. 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 But then I've but but and I got that. It came. It, it was a, a kit. Okay. That it came with a, a little hub. And um and two bulbs. Got and it. It's like twenty five bucks, which is like, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <clears throat> or forty bucks. I I forget. But uh, but now, uh, the future smart bulbs I've been getting is that uh, Home Depot has uh Cree bulbs, and they're about twelve bucks, mm. which uh, to me isn't bad for a. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's still more expensive than a conventional one, but you know. Yeah, but not much. Yeah. 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 That's right. And and they all yeah, and they all uh, uh talk to my smart things. Okay, uh, so those are hub dependent bulbs. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, Zigbee the uh, Zigbee. Yeah, 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 yeah. I right, guess. right, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So the thing I got that that I talked about last week, that's Wi Fi only. That that is not talking to the hub. Right. The, uh, AC right. control. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I like these um these, you know, Wi-Fi stuff, not having to rely on a hub. Um, I mean, if it's powered by by eight, if it's powered by battery, hub sounds like a great idea because you can do Bluetooth, low energy, easy. Wi-Fi is is cost is more energy, so it uses more juice. Uh, but you know, doing 
uh, Wi-Fi with with a bulb makes perfect sense. It's great. Nine bucks a bulb shipped, like freaking awesome. So yeah, check out those wise wise bulbs. We'll put a link to those in the show notes. And while I'm on the smart home kick, I uh, have had the opportunity to test uh, Ecobee's latest, which is their new. They call it their smart thermostat. So Ecobee is my favorite thermostat. I've been using their original like OG Ecobee three before they even added home kit support, which now everything you get from Ecobee has home kit support in addition to Google assistant and, you know, Amazon, a lady and all that stuff um, in terms of controlling them. Now the smart thermostat has voice control built into it. It's got Amazon's a lady right inside it which is really super handy because then you don't need to have another device in the same room as the thermostat to control things with your voice. And it works really well. It's also got Spotify connect built in. It can stream to your Bluetooth speakers. So you're not listening through the, uh, you know, the tiny speaker in the, in the thermostat itself. And my favorite part about Ecobee's thermostats is that they use these sensors and they've got new sensors that are um, a little bit faster and better at, at sensing both occupancy and, and, um, uh, and, and temperature, obviously. Uh, what's really cool is you can put these sensors in other rooms. Most of us live in homes where the thermostat doesn't just control the temperature in the room that it's in. In fact, a lot of us live in homes where the location of the thermostat is the non-optimal for sensing the temperature of where it controls. And that's where these sensors come in. You put these sensors in the actual rooms that it controls and you can add, you know, a bunch of them and it will sense occupancy and then adjust your, you know, your heating and or cooling systems to maximize and and get to the right temperature where you actually are, not where it is, which is really cool. So I, I've been really stoked this and this new smart thermostat having, you know, the a lady built into it and all that good stuff um, and being able to add it to home kit directly without having to use like, you know, home bridge, like I did with the old, old eco B three. It's pretty cool. I'm pretty stoked with this thing. And uh, they also have um, the eco B three light, which is controllable with you know the a lady and the the google assistant and also home kit so totally you know happy with everything it doesn't have the you know the the uh built-in a lady into it you have to have a separate device but you can get it for i don't think 80 bucks less or something i think it's 250 for the smart thermostat and that comes with one sensor and then the eco b3 light comes with no sensors and i think is 179 or something so um so yeah it's uh they're they're, they're doing it they know what they're doing that's um uh, i like it it's good it's nice to have a smart thermostat so there you go any more thoughts on that mr braun no i'm digging digging my thermostats yeah <clears throat> yeah they're cool. not as smart but eh, you know yeah, but you've got d other smarts that are like smart enough to control them, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, we're getting close to the end here. There were two things from the last show that I wanted to throw in here. Actually, the first thing I want to mention is that on Tuesday, I will be on Mac Break Weekly with, uh, with Leo Laporte and whoever his crew is this week. So I think that's at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific is what they tell me. So 2 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Uh, so there you go. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to it. Should be fun. That's uh, it, it's a marathon. You think this show is long? It, we're here. We're only at an hour and 20 minutes, man. We're just getting started. So yeah. Uh, but there were two notes in the last episode that I wanted to share. Actually, two people, many people wrote about it, but I will share um, one or, or both of these. Uh, we were talking about one of our listeners wrote in about purchasing two 16 terabyte and two 10 terabyte drives for their photos and for their data and how they intended to raid them together to, you know, to have their data be safe and all of that. And uh, many of you, Robin uh, Gillies and, and several others, in fact, pointed out that uh, there was no mention of a third drive of each kind to do backups to, and to keep at a different location. 
An accidental deletion or indeed corruption could be replicated across a raid pair and everything could be lost. So thank you. You're totally right that storing on a NAS and raid is not backup. It is just fault tolerance. So thank you to both of you for pointing that out. That's um, that's yes, that's important. Uh, good, important stuff. So thank you for for noting that. And uh, and you're right. You need yeah need something to back that up to. Otherwise, the data might as well not exist. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, any thoughts on that before I move to this uh, this thing from Bob here, John? No, no. Good point. It it is a good point. So in uh, in the last episode, we were also talking about uh, Zoom, right? Uh, and that was, I guess, the episode that we released on Monday evening. Well, on Tuesday, things with Zoom tended to change a little bit when it came out that they were using a local web server uh, that they had installed on your Mac to reinstall their software. And uh, and Bob asks now, uh, what do you think about all this? And would you continue to use Zoom? And uh, and so here's, you know, here's the thing. I totally get I actually understand how Zoom got to where they where they were with this. You know, they're we've seen maybe not quite at this scale, but we've seen things like this from Apple before, too, where, you know, engineers are just doing a thing. And it's like, how do you solve this problem in the most elegant way so that it just works for the user? Right. Zoom wanted someone to be able to click a link and it just worked. And their way of solving that was to put this web server there that was smart enough to just answer and and then fire off and do whatever it needed to do of course that leaves a huge security hole as we found because if you can click a link from an email from a trusted friend you could accidentally click a link on the web from someone else or even worse have a link clicked for you because it's you know hidden in like an image tag or something so this was a major security hole zoom ceo's original response was not great um it was just like you know he here's the thing um he basically said it's nothing uh eh, we'll take care of it but eh, don't don't worry about it jean-louis gasset had uh had a great principle that we talk about on my small business show all the time called his two tokens of customer service concept and what that boils down to is when a customer brings a problem to you, you have there are two tokens on the table. One says it's nothing and the other says it's awful. And you get to pick first because the customer has brought you the problem. So you get to pick first. But beware, because whichever token you pick up, you are forcing the customer to pick up the other one. And by picking up the it's nothing token, Zoom CEO forced his customers and by that nature all of us to have to pick up the no no it's awful token and uh and that's exactly what happened this week now in the end apple released a patch that would disable this uh zoom also released a patch i think before apple even uh that completely disabled this so they finally understood no actually it is awful but they got a lot of flack for it. And if they had just come out and said, whoa, this is awful and like really gone and freaked out about it, uh, it as they should have, then uh, things might have ended better for them. Now, will I continue to use Zoom? I, I mean, I didn't use it a whole lot in the past. I Like I said, I would use it if somebody sent me a meeting request. And if someone sends me a meeting request with it, yeah, I'll use it. Um, I, I don't let you know if that if that's what i if i want to do business with someone and they're using zoom i use it it's fine it's all good i can go and delete it afterwards that's fine i i probably wouldn't now because i know that apple has this this patch out there and also zoom has this patch out there but um but it will give me pause i you know zoom has has to earn our trust back now um they've started down that path they're not at the end of it so that's kind of my feeling on it Thoughts uh, on that, John? Yeah, I'm with you on the customer service aspect of it. Yeah. Is that the wrong answer is, oh, don't worry. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Like, I remember something similar happened with a a 
certain piece of uh, malware software. Okay. I think you may remember this where um, it was like, uh, dude, this thing has like a serious memory leak. Memory right. leak. It was like consuming all resources. And the response from the company was like, yeah, don't worry about it. It's like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Production software is not supposed to consume all resources. Right. 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 Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they eventually fixed it, but you know. Yeah, that's no bueno. You would think someone would, would kind of test that. Yeah. One would think. One would think. Yeah. <sighs> Though it's interesting because I think if you if you were running something uh you know for this for for, for Zoom, which yeah. I have I don't think I've ever used it. But um if you had something like little snitch, I think that would have given you a heads up that something wacky's going on. Oh, right? probably. Yeah, yeah. That was oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. But you might not notice it, right? Like if, if it all, because it would all happen the first time you launched zoom and it would be like zoom wants to effectively access the internet. Like, yeah, same. And so you probably say, yeah, but you know, so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any, we're, we're way past the end here. So I think we will leave things there. I, you know, we won't. Actually, there's something very important that I want to take care of here, John, and that's that I want to take care of our premium listeners and our premium supporters. And I want to say thank you to all of you who have contributed in the last week plus here. So on our uh, monthly $10 plan, I want to say thank you to Elizabeth from Virginia, Stephen from California, Ward from Arizona, Joan from Florida, Ev the Nerd from California, Olga from Washington, Jason from Charlestown, Stephen from Illinois, Kenneth from New South Wales, Nick from Michigan, Paul from Indiana, Mark from Connecticut, Ryan from Texas, Neil from Connecticut, Scott from Portland, Peter from Maine, Bob, whose question we just answered, from Working Smarter for Mac users, James from San Antonio, Jay from New Jersey, Joe from Kansas, Chris from Hertfordshire, Abdullah from Maryland and Ari from California on the $10 a month plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you on our biannual plan, which by default is $25 every six months. I want to say thanks to David P to John from Alabama to Robert from Florida, Mary from California at a hundred dollars every six months, Corey from Washington, Mike from Illinois, Richard from Gwynedd for $30 every six months, Jason from Missouri, Norton from Maryland, Edward from Texas, JP from California at 50 every six months, Michael from Michigan, Joel F, Craig S, Avram from California, Tony G, John O, Michael P, Paul from Kent, Gary from Chicago, Richard from Pennsylvania, Dennis from Chapel Hill, also at $30, Bruce from Virginia, Greg from Los Angeles, Ron G, Anthony N, Deb from California, and Doug from North York. And two one-time contributions, uh, $50 from Deborah from Houston and 20 from Paul Pizza. So thank you to all of you. And if you want to learn more about that, of course, um, go to MacGeekGab.com slash premium. That will get you all of that good stuff. Anything else, John, while we're here? One last thing. I might share a quick tip. In fact, if, if we don't have anything else, there is one last quick tip I want to share. So, but... Uh, but, okay. you know, we'll go there. But if there, if you have something else, then that's fine. No. No? Okay. Uh, Mark has a quick tip for us. And Mark says, uh, you talked about print dialogue some while ago, and I kept meaning to send you this note, but I never got around to it in last week's 769. You talked about printers again, so now I cannot avoid sending it. Like a lot of folks, I have printer, print many printers to find on my MacBook for both work and home. And it is not uncommon that I send a print job to the wrong printer. I would then typically recreate the content and send it to the right printer. But then came the day when I could not recreate the content and could not wait to go back to work the next day to print. I then realized it was as simple as opening both printer dialogues and dragging the document from one to the other. I have no idea if this is news to you, he says, but it sure was to me. So I think we've talked about this on the show before, but it is a great quick tip. If you go, in fact, I, I think you mentioned it on the show in the past, John, but I, you do it by going to system preferences, printers and scanners. And in there, you see all your printers. If you double click them, it will open the print queue or you can click the button to open the print queue and do that for both printers. Drag the document from one to the other and boom, there you go. Good, uh, good stuff. I like it. 
And uh, and I think with that, Mr. Braun, we uh, we've made it through. I was gonna say unscathed, but not quite. We we had those mm-hmm. audio issues again. Just weird on a new computer. So it's got to be something else. Uh, there's some there's some talk in the chat room about maybe this uh, Thunderbolt to uh, or th- yeah Thunderbolt to FireWire adapter being the issue. So it could be that's that is somewhat new. It's not new with this new computer, but it's new as of. The last couple of weeks, maybe, uh, maybe a month and a half ago at most. So it could be that could be the the source of of some of these problems. So we'll see. We'll see how we do with USB audio. We can always, always switch back. So we made it, John, just not unscathed. Any uh, anything to add? No, I hear you you wheezy. Everything all right over there? Just oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, Mark pointed out that, uh, I think it was Mark, I might have it wrong, Matt, sorry, pointed out, he's like, I went to vote for you in the podcast awards at podcastawards.com, but I couldn't find you. And it's true. He says, there was no place to link to voting. And it's true. It's nominations that are open. And it's sort of the same as voting. So when you get there, click the link to nominate and, uh, and that should do it. So, sorry about that. It says click here to nominate. That's what you want to click. So, thank you for those of you that have done that. And if you haven't, now's your chance. You can go do it still here in July. I think we've got, I don't know. I don't I don't know if it runs all of July, but we certainly have a few more days. So, if you haven't done it yet, please, please, please. We would love it. Love it. We told you how to reach us. You premium listeners, of course, can use premium at MacGeekGab.com. Um... Uh, I don't know. That's, that, that's good enough. We've given a lot of instructions and requests. We can leave it at that for a little while. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, all of our sponsors. I, actually, I want to thank all of you because without all of you, it doesn't matter if we have sponsors. In fact, sponsors probably wouldn't be interested. So we try to be very respectful of that. So thank you for listening, for doing all that you do. Make sure to sign up at MacGeekUp.com for our weekly emails that uh, that come out when the show comes out with all the links and everything. That way you can make sure to get everything. Uh, anything else, John, before we head out for today? Nope. All right. Well, then it's time. I want to thank all our sponsors. As we mentioned in the show, Experian.com slash MGG, Mac.Cashfly.com, Smile Software at Smile, or Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com, Eero.com slash MGG, Barebones.com. Lino.com slash MVP. John, I hope you have a good week. Actually, we're recording next week's episode a little early because of some travel. Uh, so we'll be recording on Friday, but of course, just releasing Monday. So if you want to join us in the chat room, of course, you can do that. You can join our calendar at MacGeekGab.com slash calendar so you know when all that's happening. But in the meantime, between now and when we all get to chat next, I just want to wish you to wish all of us well maybe the best way to do that is a harmonious wishing don't get caught get caught get caught don't get caught get caught Made up.